Welcome everyone tonight for, for this webinar. Um, I'm Fred Marcel. I am the CEO and founder of Cube Innovation. Uh, and I'm also the inventor of the Innobyte, which is a product we're going to be talking a little bit about tonight. Um, we're feeling very fortunate to be having this webinar presented by Dr. Isaac Barsley and Dr. Ella Berus tonight, which um, I happened to met in 2019 during a dental convention in Toronto. Uh, and I was very fortunate to to catch his eye with our boot because I think when Dr. Barzi passed by, saw our product, he thought it was pretty interesting what we were trying to do. Uh, so right away, I think he, he saw the potential. And since then, they have been using uh, our technology and have been avid users. So we we are thankful for that. Furthermore, tonight, it's going to be a great webinar. Um, we want everybody to ask as many questions as possible during the webinar. We will, however, answer all of them at the end of the webinar. So during the webinar, please write them out uh, in either the chat. You can click at the bottom of your screen on the chat or the Q&A button and just write them out. And at the end, we're going to discuss them. We're also going to be using poll questions during the webinar. So please answer them. Uh, and we're going to be discussing the results as well during the presentation with Dr. Barsley. So with this, I'm not going to take more time from their presentations. So without further ado, Dr. Barzi, Dr. Beruz, uh, I'll pass over the microphone to you guys for the webinar. Thank you. Wonderful. Good evening, Frederick. I hope everything is well with you. And good evening to all the attendees. Thank you for spending part of your Tuesday night with us. And we have a chance to talk about uh, some what we think is very interesting uh, technical information and stuff that we use all the time. And so the title of this presentation is uh, Bite Force Measurements, Effects on Materials and Treatment Choices. And why don't we just uh, get, uh, get right into it. There we go, okay. So I am, uh, I, I'm Isaac Barsley, I'm a prosthodontist. I practice uh, uh, in, uh, in Toronto at uh, Midtown. Uh, I do a lot of other things. Uh, I will talk to you at the end of the presentation about the Build Your Smile Dental Foundation. Um, but I, I've been involved with the American Prosthodontic Society, still involved with Mount Sinai Hospital here in Toronto, the Faculty of Dentistry in Toronto, George Brown College, also uh, here in Toronto. Uh, I do spend time at the Eastman Department of Dentistry in Rochester. And from a private practice perspective, I do limit my practice to prosthodontics and implant dentistry. And the person who is sitting next to me really does not need uh, any introduction. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Ella Berus. I'm not going to tell you how we first met because whenever I do that, I embarrass her. Um, but she is really a wonderful uh, prosthodontist. I got to uh, work with her at the faculty, and then she joined our practice uh, here at Young and Eglinton. Um, she is a consultant in the Division of Prosthodontics and Restorative Dentistry at Mount Sinai Hospital. She's also an associate in dentistry at the Faculty of Dentistry in Toronto, and she does limit her practice to. Uh, prosthodontics and implant dentistry. In addition, she is the Chief of Clinical Operations for our domestic division for our foundation, and we will talk more about that at the end of, uh, of the presentation. Uh, these are our email addresses, our websites. Uh, you can find us if, if you go online. It's really not that difficult. I'm very proud of the, of the office that we work in. Uh, it is a large uh, group specialty practice. Uh, we've been uh, at this location uh, since uh, 1989, but we initiated the concept of prosthodontic associates before that. If you're ever in Toronto, I welcome you to come and join us. And what I'm really most proud of are the people that I work with. We are a large group and um, we're a group of uh, dental specialists, support staff, administrative staff, lab staff. We're, we're a little bit of everything. And um, it's a pleasure to come to work every day. And it's because of these people that I can come to work and enjoy myself the way I always do when I get here. 
a little bit about the history of uh, prosthodontic associates uh, initiated in 87 as a private practice. At that time, one prosthodontist, one dental assistant, one uh, RDT, registered dental technologist, and one receptionist. Our first associate came in in 1997. Our second came in at 2004. And obviously we've grown a lot since then. Our first periodontist came in in 2005. And we've had constant growth in personnel and office space. I mean, at this point, uh, we are up to uh, 8,500 square feet. We have an education center. We have uh, 10 specialists that work within the facility, 20 staff people, and we're still growing. In fact, we just took on another 1,000 square feet um, for additional operatories. So people ask me, uh, are you ever going to slow down? And I tell them I'm really not allowed to because I'm having such a good time. So that's a little bit about us. And really what I briefly like to talk about initially is stable occlusion, because we're going to talk a lot about occlusion today. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, the effects of occlusal forces on restorations, how to use the knowledge of how hard a patient bites to help choose a kind of restoration that we'd like to work with. Uh, but first, we have to really understand what is stable occlusion. I know this is not new information. I mean, stable uh, occlusion involves stable occlusal contacts on all teeth in a centric relation position. Um, anterior guidance needs to be in harmony with the border movements of the ev envelope of function. And when we move protrusively, we expect to see disclusion of the posterior teeth. That to us is a very stable occlusion. Obviously, there are variations on this. And uh, there are very functional occlusions that may not even relate to this. But we like to keep the concept of stable occlusion in mind. Uh, we have disclusion of the posterior teeth on non-working or balancing side and non-interference of the posterior teeth on the working side with anterior guidance and border movements uh, of the condyle. So if we sort of keep that in mind that that is in fact what we call stable occlusion, what we're going to do in just a moment is go into what is the workup for um, occlusion assessment. And with that being said, uh, we're gonna have our first polling question. So Frederick, why don't you go ahead with that first polling question? Wonderful, so Marion is gonna launch the first poll in a second here. So everybody should see the question on, on your screen. Please uh, submit your, uh, your answer. We're going to be discussing the results in a second. So the question is, do you perform an occlusal assessment as part of your initial exam or consult currently? So we're going to give uh, uh, maybe a minute for everyone to submit, and then we can look at the results. So answers are still coming in. Um, it's it's already interesting to see the distribution. Um, so we're going to give ten more seconds for everyone to submit, and then we'll look at the results. Okay, so Dr. Barsley and Beirut, do you see the results? Yes. All right, so I'll let you comment on them. So, I mean, it's amazing to see that most of you guys actually do perform an assessment. Uh, it doesn't really matter if it's an analog assessment or if it's a digital assessment. And for those who responded, no, maybe we can change your mind. So with that said, I am going to close this here and I am going to move ahead with the rest of the presentation, which focuses on for a couple of minutes, work up for occlusal assessment. What I want you to take away from this small part of the presentation is that um, every single patient that sits in our chair, a simple occlusal evaluation should be undertaken for them. Even if we're just planning for a single crown on this particular patient, 
I mean, any comprehensive dental examination should include an occlusal evaluation or an occlusal assessment. I'm going to take a couple of minutes to just talk about how we do it, how it can be done. There are very simple methods of doing it. Uh, we're very used to getting a very comprehensive medical history from the patient. Um, there is no question that we do a comprehensive, we obtain a comprehensive dental history from the patient and a comprehensive clinical examination. So when we do a comprehensive clinical examination, we'll look at teeth, we'll look at mobilities, we'll look at the, uh, you know, if this, the dentition is heavily restored, moderately restored, minimally restored, uh, what type of restorations, direct, indirect, the quality of the restorations, the quality of the periodontium, the health of the periodontium, mobilities, probing depths, all of those. But we sometimes forget that Maybe more important than many of, the, many of the factors that we do assess and document is to have an initial occlusal evaluation. And maybe part of our comprehensive medical and dental history should also focus on factors that are related to that occlusal evaluation. For example, does the patient have any previous trauma? Did this trauma affect their dentition in any manner, shape, or form? Did this trauma perhaps affect their TMJ, affect their what we're going to be talking about their bite force. Previous, I'm going to, OE by OE, we mean occlusal equilibration. If a patient presents and mentions to us that, you know, I've been to dentists before and they've all performed some sort of an occlusal adjustment or bite adjustment for me, is that a red flag? Is that a warning sign? What effects have the occlusal equilibration process has, you know, has had on their dentition or on their TMJ perhaps? Does the patient present with any history of temporomandibular disorders? Is the patient undergoing any treatment for any temporomandibular disorders? And this is partially important for our diagnostic purposes and also very important for our documentation purposes because particularly in patients that were performing larger treatment, more comprehensive treatment, there are many times that they, they don't they don't intend to blame us, but they do actually blame us for many, the, many of the issues that they probably had from the beginning. But now because of comprehensive dental treatment, we've drawn their attention to issues that they've already had. So if we have a documentation that you know this patient already presents with TMD or temporomandibular disorders, or maybe bite force issues, uh, or is undergoing treatment for temporomandibular disorders, then we can always present to the patient that this is not as who's or the dental treatment performed by as who's which has caused the issue here. Parafunctional habits and their management fits into the same category, basically. So whenever we're looking at any changes to occlusion, um, whether it's because we want to optimize bite forces or, um, um, you know, distribution of the forces or just the way the patient or to obtain some parameters of the stable occlusion that we uh, very briefly spoke about, there is a need for us to always do a mock-up occlusal equilibration. So mounted models, mounted study casts of the patient, careful occlusal adjustment, trial occlusal adjustment on the models, and to visualize the outcomes. Is it going to have any effect on their um, vertical dimension of occlusion? Is it going to actually lead to resolution of the problem that the patient is seeking treatment for, or are we going to be causing more problems? So occlusal equilibration, occlusal evaluation is quite tricky. So whenever we're trying to change occlusion, ideally there should be a mock-up occlusal equilibration. Visualization of the outcome is very important in the sense of, you know, how much adjustment or tooth structure removal is required. Let's say a patient has a couple of premature contacts in CR and in, in lateral excursive movements or in protrusive movements. We're trying to address this. And uh, basically we're visually looking at the dentition and we assume that if we adjust a couple of spots, this is gonna result in an improvement in the, um, you know, in the smoothness of the envelope of function. Is this actually true? Are we, are we sure that this is gonna happen? I mean, the only, the only way to tell is to have a mock-up occlusal equilibration. We can also see the effect on overall occlusion, the effect on the vertical dimension of occlusion. This is particularly in situations where the patient either has very few centric stops or we're looking at more comprehensive occlusal equilibration. Basically, we're touching more than one centric stop. So in those situations, are we affecting the vertical dimension of occlusion? 
what is going to be the effect of what I'm doing on the patient's function on even the interproximal context? Am I, am I, if I'm adjusting a marginal ridge area, am I going to con compromise an interproximal contact? Adverse outcomes, for example, are we introducing any new slides or loss of vertical dimension of occlusion to the patient? So these are all questions that are sometimes difficult to answer, but when we've got that mock-up occlusal equilibration, the answers can be very clear. So how do we do this initial occlusal uh, evaluation? It doesn't have to be complicated. So most of you answered that you do an analog occlusal uh, evaluation, and that's a perfect way to do things. Mounted casts is one way to do it. Of course, we can take scans. We can even do photographs, simple photographs of the occlusal marks or contacts after we've basically marked the occlusal contact in centric and eccentric movements, perhaps in different colors of articulating paper and even bite registration material. So as simple as, as I mentioned, mounted casts, good impressions, properly articulated models are invaluable. The only problem is that, you know, the, the wear on the, on the, on the cast after a, after a while of, you know, storing things can be an issue with this, uh, with this uh, method of um, evaluation. So scans can be very valuable when it comes to, you know, maintaining information in the shape and form uh, that the patient presented uh, with. So scans can be great uh, for doing that. Photographs of occlusal marks or contacts are a great way to document things as well. Um, it sometimes can be tricky to, you know, depending on the quality of the photographs, but it's it's definitely a good tool to have. And another great tool is to just basically ask the patient to, uh, to bite on some bite registration material. Mm -hmm. So these are all uh, silicone type uh, polyvinyl style bite registration materials. And the reason that we have a couple of different uh, colors here is that, you know, some colors can can be better diagnostically than the others. The more matte the uh, bite registration material is, typically the more diagnostic it can be. When you hold it um, you know, in the light, it can actually show you where the light passes through, where the penetrations or the holes basically are. So those are the actual contacts or near contacts that the patient has. Uh, when we're using clear material, as I have, as, as we have in the picture here, it might not be as diagnostic, but any sort of bite registration material can give you invaluable uh, information. So with that being said, before proceeding to the next part of the presentation, Frederick, can we have another polling question up, please? Absolutely. So we're gonna be launching the second question. Okay. So question number two uh, is, are you comfortable using digital technology in your practice? <clears throat> Great, so we'll give uh, 10 more seconds for everybody to answer. Okay, let's look at the results. Well, you know, it's uh, interesting results. Uh, most people are comfortable using it. There's a small number that are not and some that are somewhat, which are probably on their way to being comfortable is how I would look at this. Um, digital technologies or just the word digital is such a buzzword these days. And I think we just all have to remember that it's just a way for us to collect information. Whether we do it with a computer or whether we do it with other means, um, as long as we're collecting the proper information, whether you're digital or analog, I don't think it matters, but using digital technologies gives us a few advantages. And uh, we hope that uh, some of those advantages will come out uh, in, in this presentation. So thank you for answering that question. Okay, so why don't we look at occlusion and bite force and let's relate it a little bit to collecting information on, on a digital scale. There's lots of ways to collect information, uh, especially when we first meet our patients. Uh, we're all familiar with digital photography. We're familiar with digital radiography and 
digital radiography has made a huge difference to what we do in the clinical practice. We can extend the digital uh, capture of information to uh, facebook records and jaw movements um, to the idea of using different scanners to scan different things and to scan different ways. I think there's a lot to be said for using scanners at the initial appointment, capturing the patient's exact tooth position and exact tooth shape so that you can compare things later uh, to what the patient looked like when we began is vital. We used to make a lot of casts that would do this, but it's pretty hard to compare casts. On a digital level, it's a lot simpler because a lot of these digital records can be mounted one on top of the other on top of the other. So uh, using these intraoral scanners is, is a wonderful thing. And then taking this information and combining it with the radiographs and combining it with jaw motions and combining it with occlusal markings and combining it with facial pictures pretty much gives us a digital patient. And we've talked about this, at least here in the office for many years, how wonderful it would be to be able to have the whole patient in the computer digitally to see what it is that we need to do and how our treatment affects them. And today, this is in fact possible. I'm not suggesting for a moment that you jump into all of this all at once. It takes time to get used to all of these different technologies. But I will tell you that once it all gets put together, it's really quite intriguing. One of my, my, one of my favorite things is uh, looking to see differences in tooth structure between appointments, looking for wear, looking for abfraction lesions, looking for toothbrush abrasion, looking for tooth movements, and by laying scans on top of scans, we can actually do this and we can give the patient a dynamic assessment of what's going on. And I think that that's really important. You know, this week I saw a patient who um, came to see us. He's a trumpet player. And we worked a long time on making him a set of crowns for his upper anterior teeth. And they had to fit not only within the confines of what crowns should look like, but they had to work with him playing the trumpet. And he had come in originally with teeth that were just too big. And it was hard for him to play the trumpet. And this was his livelihood. So we worked with the temporary restorations. And we got them to the point where he was good, we were good. We made the final crowns to duplicate them. And then we proved to ourselves and to our patient that, in fact, the final crowns were identical to the temporary crowns by putting one scan on top of the other scan. And um, it was wonderful. It was really wonderful. So there's a lot of ways you can use this technology. Uh, marking occlusal contacts and where they are and, and uh, the surface area of these contacts. Uh, we were able to do this with these intraoral scanners. We're also able, obviously, to do shade selection. And there's a bunch of other things that we can do. And today, with some of the technology that we're going to introduce to you, we can also measure bite forces with absolute numbers. And that's valuable. That's very valuable. And I think um, I'm going to ask uh, Marianne now to uh, go ahead with the next polling question. Great. So um, the next question is, do you use an intral scanner in your practice? Okay, so we'll give 10 more seconds and we're going to look at the answers.
Okay. Okay, so I mean, you know, um, some of you do once a week, some daily, and some never use introller scanners, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, I mean, um, use of digital technology has led to simplification of many processes. Uh, impressions are probably one of them, but I would say at this point, for obtaining impressions or, you know, um, for the for the use that scanners are mostly used for, um, there is a whole lot of differences and um, there's a whole lot of subjectivity from the clinicians. And there are those of us who are very, very good with analog impression taking. And uh, I, I, I just think that, I, I just wanna add here that there's more to intraoral scanners than obtaining, uh, obtaining impressions. So to just register how the patient initially presents to you is another valuable thing that they can do. And, you know, um, registering um, the patient's presentation six months after to follow up a tooth surface loss, the way uh, Dr. Barsley mentioned, the name of uh, the application that does that is time-lapse technology. Uh, so uh, it's another great tool to use, even if you don't want to use scanners for impression taking. There are a lot of other things that scanners can do for you. With that being said, um, let us talk a little bit about uh, occlusion and bite force in general before we get into bite force measurement. Bite force is something that we are never, never discussing in dental school. And mind you, we don't even discuss it in grad school. When I did my graduate prosthodontic training, uh, bike force was not part of my, um, you know, official curriculum um, during the learning process I had in the three years of grad pros. And uh, occlusion, the way we look at it is how and when the teeth come together. Perhaps more important than that is how much force a patient can generate. And we always forget to measure that. We always forget to even assess that, acknowledge that that's a very important diagnostic factor. And what is it? It is a, it's basically uh, an indica indication of how healthy the masticatory system is. It's generally three times higher in the posterior parts of the mouth. It's less, basically three times less in the anterior parts of the mouth. So what what leads to a high bite force? What leads to a low bite force? This is a function of the elevator jaw muscle. So the three pairs, one, one person, I mean, you know, the three muscles per side, the number of teeth that the patient has, generally the, the more teeth the patient has, the higher the forces they can generate. The condition of the dentition, so generally, the better the condition of the dentition, the interdigitation, the occlusal scheme, and the periodontal status of the teeth, the more the bite force, uh, the more um, bite force the patient can generate. It also has to do with pain threshold. So different patients present with very many, where, with, with a very big range of pain thresholds that we see with in, in patients, right? So we can see a very healthy patient with healthy muscles. Um, all the teeth present in very good condition, but because the patient's very sensitive, they basically don't press the teeth too hard together. So when we're doing a bite, for, bite force measurement, because of the pain threshold, uh, this patient does not, does not generate a high bite force, whereas everything is actually healthy and in, in good condition. And there are patients who actually have a very, very high pain tolerance. And despite the fact that things are less than ideal, they're partially edentulous perhaps, or some of the teeth are periodontally compromised, they actually generate very, very high bite forces. So it, 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 the reason I put this here is because we actually have to have an objective tool to measure bite force, as opposed to just saying, you know, this patient has healthy muscles, all the teeth are present, minimally restored dentition, and not periodontally involved. Therefore, I'm going to assume that they generate high bite forces. That's actually not the case in many patients. So to have a tool that objectively shows us a number which is associated with that bite force is very, very valuable. Now, about numbers, you know, when we're looking at bite force, generally we're looking at the highest numbers in the molar regions or in the posterior parts of the mouth. Based on the literature, when we do a unilateral measurement in the posterior part, we're looking at numbers between three to 600 newtons. Now, anterior teeth generate about 40% of that unilateral force, and premolar teeth generate about 70% of that unilateral force. 
When we measure things bilaterally in the molar region, typically we get a number which is 40%, almost double the amount, higher than the unilateral measurement. So this is very important because if a patient does not have posterior occlusion or what we call posterior support, and all the forces are concentrated in the front part of the mouth, the teeth are probably not designed to endure those kind of forces. This does not mean that in every single patient we have to restore the posterior occlusion, but it does mean that in patients who are high bite force generators, perhaps a discussion at minimal should be, should be undertaken with these patients to talk about the consequences of not restoring the dentition. It's also higher in adults when we comp in comparison to children. Uh, in patients who have um, you know, a, a, a square shaped jaw or perhaps rectangular craniofacial morphology, they generate higher bite forces than patients who have long faces. Patients with long facial structures many times have anterior open bites and less bite force generation. Skeletal deep bite patients generate higher forces than patients who have an open bite. And generally, when we look at the gender, by MVBF, we mean maximum voluntary bite force is generally higher in our male patients in comparison to female patients. And when we look at the age, typically younger patients generate more forces or higher forces. So why is it important to know if a patient has high bite forces or low bite forces? So generally, the literature suggests that patients who generate lower bite forces may suffer from inefficient chewing, which may lead to poor nutritional choices, as opposed to incorporating lots of fruits and vegetables, which may be a little more challenging to chew properly. They may include a lot of softer carbohydrate-based um, foods into their diet. So in general, it is noted that it can impact oral health related quality of life in a negative manner. So it's very important to know if a patient suffers from low bite force. And we'll talk about that later in the presentation in more detail, but this can pertain to patients who have complete dentures or even partial dentures that are probably ill-fitting or with teeth that have worn down. They suffer from loss of vertical dimension of occlusion as a, as a result of the wear and tear on the prosthetic teeth. And this can be very common in these patients. Or if for whatever reason, a removable prosthesis leads to some sort of a discomfort or pain, and then the patient hesitates to chew properly or generate sufficient forces, these can be complications that the patient may be dealing with. When we look at higher bite forces, it's easier to think about the complications that may arise. So we're looking at possible tooth-related complications. We're looking at possible rest restoration-related complications. Implant-related complications have been documented in the literature. These are typically mechanical complications or technical implant-related complications. We'll talk about them. And also hypertrophy of the muscles of mastication. And sometimes this is unilateral leading to maybe perhaps even asymmetry in the facial appearance. So these are all concerns that patients may have. When we're looking at tooth-related complications, what are we looking at? So many of these patients present with what we call the cracked tooth syndrome. So the patient presents with a cracked tooth on, you know, on, on one tooth, and then it basically, uh, that tooth is extracted or dealt with in whatever restorative manner possible, depending on the extension and the prognosis of the crack. And, and then they present with another one. And there are sometimes the patient presents with a vertical root fracture, which basically renders the tooth to be hopeless tooth surface loss or wear and tear. Sometimes it's a result of parafunctional habit in patients who generate by forces that are within the range of normal, but sometimes it's actually in patients who generate very high bite forces and they can be managed if we diagnose that this patient is a high bite force generator. Mobility of the teeth without any periodontal disease, secondary to occlusal forces. And when we've got generalized tooth surface loss, we can even have loss of vertical dimension of occlusion, which can make it a complex treatment to begin with, because at that point, we're looking at either just monitoring and seeing if things are getting worse or not, or basically comprehensive management, which more often than not cannot be very conservative at that point, right? So loss of vertical dimension of occlusion can result in as well. 
And these are obviously patients who have had um, high for, uh, by forces for a very long time, not controlled and generalized to surface loss. Restoration related complications. So fracture of the restorations, restorations can break off, missing restorations, as you can see in the photographs, wear of the rest, restorations or the restored uh, tooth surfaces. And again, when we're looking at a heavily restored dentition and a patient who is, um, who's suffering from um, loss or a fracture or missing surfaces on the restoration, perhaps even loss of vertical dimension of occlusion if sufficient centric stops have been affected. So again, we're into a situation where diagnostics and treatment provision can become a little complex or more complex. Implant related complications. So implants typically may have different types of failures. Uh, or complications. There are biological complications, which are associated with the biology, with the bone around the implant. We're not really talking about that here. We're looking at mechanical or technical complications, which sometimes can be as serious as biological complications. There are times that an implant has to be removed secondary to such technical complications. So they can be as simple as perhaps if we've got a bilayered structure on the implant, such as porcelain fused to zirconia or porcelain fused to metal, maybe the porcelain veneer fractures off. That's the most simple thing that can happen. With screw retained restorations, we may experience screw loosening. And if that's not addressed, even fracture of the screw. And then, you know, a, a fracture of the implant fixture itself, which again, can be a complicated situation to deal with. We're either going to have to think of outside the box methods of restoring that particular implant, which is outside the scope of this presentation, or perhaps removing the implant and with, it, with or without replacement. Those are situations that we're going to have to think about in patients who are probably thinking of a, a, a implant-based care or have implants in their mouths possibly. So along the same lines, the, the challenge is with, when we're looking at teeth, we have a lot of documentation on what is the ideal crown to root ratio? What is um, What can be detrimental bite loads on different teeth? I mean, we've got some documentation on them. We don't really have any uh, well-established parameters when we're looking at implants yet. So crown to implant ratio, for example, detrimental bite loads on implants. What is the actual bone quality and volume which is needed to resist a particular patient's jaw force? So these are questions about implants that there is literature to support or answer each of these questions, but there's not um, there is not a lot of consensus on the numbers that you see on the literature in the literature. So it becomes even more complex to diagnose and treatment plan and you know troubleshoot these cases. So I mean, my two cents here is if we can avoid mechanical complications, if we can detect those patients who are more at risk of mechanical complications for implant-based care, maybe we can engineer their case towards you know better maintaining the implant and the bone. So uh, before getting into the next part of the presentation, Frederick, may I ask you to have our next polling question up, please? Absolutely. Um, so the next question is, uh, do you feel comfortable adjusting occlusion on different tooth and implant-supported restorations? So we're gonna give 10 more seconds, everyone, to submit your answers and we'll look at the results together. <clears throat> A uh, quick comment, Dr. Beirut. I think what you just said was very, very interesting about, you know, engineering the treatment plan based on the bite force that the patients are applying prior to, you know, placing the restorations in the mouth to potentially prevent complications down the line. I think that's, that's just so interesting. Okay, so when we, when we look at this question, do you feel comfortable adjusting occlusion on, on either implant or restoration? Um, large number of you are either yes or somewhat. And obviously, if we're doing these kinds of restorations, we have to be able to adjust occlusion. And sometimes this just comes with experience. Some of our uh, younger listeners may not have had that much experience in dental school. 
Uh, they may not have been taught how to adjust appropriately. So uh, I can understand some of the, uh, the no answers. But as we gain experience, we all have to feel comfortable making appropriate adjustments. I think we just have to know what to adjust and then consider the materials and then use appropriate methods uh, to adjust. So thank you for answering uh, that polling question. So what I think I'd like to do now is, uh, is get into bite assessment. And really what does bite assessment mean? So Ella already described ways of recording what the bite is using photography, using uh, articulating papers, things like that. But we have to go beyond this static assessment of, of what the patient comes in with. Uh, when I was a student, which was a very, very, very long time ago, um, the only thing we were taught about occlusion was right down where the patient contacts. And there was this funny little form that we used to use. And I think there are probably still some places that use that kind of thing. Well, you know, we're in a different world now. And I think we need to address some of these other assessment methods. So there are three modes to identify, to quantify, and to locate and assess bite and the forces. Well, you've got the conventional mode, the non-digital mode, which we sort of presented. Okay, the idea of marking with paper. And again, you have to understand how articulating paper works. Um, there's an art to it, and there's an art to reading how it actually works. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know it, it can get you into some trouble when you start adjusting. If I was to give anybody some advice on how to use articulating paper, I think my best form of advice would be don't take more than three bite measurements with the same piece of articulating paper because the ink runs out and, use a paper. and yeah and you're right yeah. and use thin articulating paper don't use that really really thick thick horseshoe stuff you know and i say that because i can't tell you the number of times i i stop my students or my residents and i ask how long have you been using that piece of articulating paper and um they say since the beginning of the appointment and you start wondering what's it really doing, right? So that would be my my best my best bit of advice for articulating paper. Understand that it's ink and ink runs out. So I would my our staff is trained that after two or three uses of that strip of paper, they're automatically changing it without being asked to do it. And I find that we need to do that. Now that's a very a conventional way of doing it. And there's nothing wrong with that. But we need to understand that we also have other methods to do it. Uh, one is using the, the T-scan method. And I'll show you uh, some examples of this. This is a computerized method that looks at the contact points where they are, but also looks at occlusion from a timing perspective. And I think this is very interesting. I think that when we ask a patient about occlusion, we often say, well, how does that crown fit? How does it feel? How's the bite? And the patient says, the bite's just fine. And why do they say that? Because they want to get out of there. They don't want to stick around too long. My questions are always, do you bite on the right and left sides at the same time? And if not, where do you bite first? And in fact, T-scan, is able to tell you this because T-Scan produces a video and shows how the contacts come into play. It shows which teeth come into play first, second, and third. And it can quantify only from the perspective of that particular video that you're looking at. It does not give you an absolute number that you can compare at another appointment. So, it's a very useful tool. Don't get me wrong. It's very, very useful uh, to try to get the bite contacting at the same time if that's what you're looking for. And in fact, I like to think that's what I'm looking for. So we do use that. And in addition, we use uh, the InnoBite, 
And what the inner byte gives us is the actual amount of byte force. So it gives us a number in newtons. And you can come back a few days later and do it again. And as long as the patient bites the same way, you're going to get that same number. That doesn't actually happen with, um, with the T-scan. So it's a very, uh, it's a different kind of concept. Innobite will give you overall bite force uh, measurements, bite force numbers, and T-scan will give you this dynamic view of how the jaw moves and comes into contact. And sometimes between the two of them, you get a very interesting view of what is actually happening. So if we look at bite force assessment historically, there's different ways that people have done this. This is not a new concept. If you go back and you look at some of the literature, you know, going back uh, 50 years, 60 years, 70 years, you know, we've looked at transducers on, uh, on dentures to see what kind of forces are being exerted on the denture when you actually bite on it. We've looked at strain gauges. We've, this is a, dy a dynamometer. Okay, which again, will look at bite forces. So I tell you that if you go and you Google bite force assessment, you're gonna come up with all kinds of interesting things. It's actually, uh, it's actually quite entertaining. And these are just some pictures that we've just pulled off the, uh, the internet showing different ways that people have come up with to evaluate uh, forces in the bite. Some will measure, some will tell you where you bite harder or less or lighter. Um, and, and it's interesting. It's actually very interesting to look at some of these things. So when we go to look at bite assessment from the digital perspective, what you're seeing here is in fact the T-scan. So this is a device that puts a sensor between your teeth much like if, if you're getting orthotics done and you're asked by your uh, foot doctor to walk on a sensor and the sensor produces a colored version of where the pressures are, this is the same idea. And it can show you in a two-dimensional way and in a three-dimensional way where the pressures are the highest, where they are the lowest, where you don't have any pressure whatsoever. Now, where does all this stuff come from? This really uh, comes from um, aeronautic the industry, from the automotive industry, where they use this kind of technology to check how hard does a car door slam? How, how much does the window close? They're looking for pressures. And this was modified really for pressures in the mouth. And what this again gives you is where and in what sequence the bite comes into play. And I think that's very valuable because if it's up to me, I'd like to know that all my teeth are coming into play at the same time. And that gives me comfort. Which tooth bites harder and when? So it won't tell you the exact hardness in the sense of how many Newtons are being generated, but it will tell you which tooth bites first and if that tooth bites harder than the one next to it, that's what it will tell you. And again, it does not show absolute value of the overall bite strength, which I think is something that we have to think about and we have to consider. And really what that does now is that brings us into the digital assessment using the InnoBite. And what this does, is this is a bite force assessment tool. So when you bite on it, you get a number. And that number is supposed to tell you the general forces overall in the mouth that are being generated and how you can relate those forces to function is at that point up to you. And it is something that we learn how to do. So it's an overall bite force. And this particular device has been made by a Cube Innovation. Uh, we've had this device with us for several years now, and it is extremely useful under many, many conditions. And I think that uh, maybe at this point, we're gonna ask for the next polling question, Frederick. Great. Uh, before we, we launch a poll, I'd like to remind everybody, if you do have some questions about 
what Dr. Barzin and Beruz are presenting, you can type in uh, type them in into the Q and A or the chat, and we'll answer them at the end. Um, so, next question is: How do you currently measure bite force in your practice? The good news is we've got some some Innovite users as well in the crowd tonight, so um, <laughs> that's also always great to see. Okay, so that's great. Uh, I see that, yes, 5% of our um, amazing attendees are using Innovite. So yes, and a lot of you guys are using articulating paper. Uh, the comment I want to make here is that it's a little bit of a tricky question. Um, you're probably not going to be able to measure bite force with any device except for the Innovite. But um, if you're using the T-scan or articulating paper for um, assessing occlusion, then that's a great, I mean, they're great tools to be used. So with that being said, I think I'm going to get into some clinical relevant questions and how bite force measurement can answer some very, very clinically relevant common questions. I'm going to call this section bite force and treatment planning. And this is probably my favorite part of the presentation because I get very, very excited about this particular part of the presentation. These are all questions that uh, I have to ask myself when I'm treating patients uh, as I'm practicing prosthodontics. And a lot of our residents and our undergraduate students used to ask me, you know, when, I'm, when, I, was, when I was involved with the clinical um, um, teaching at the, at the school. I still am, but I just had a baby. So I'm on uh, technically, <laughs> this, when, when it comes to the school, um, I, I'm on, on mat leave, but not when it comes to clinical practice. That never ends. But um, yes, yeah, so, you know, questions from, um, students, from residents, from, you know, patients, from myself, um, when I'm answering a, when I'm trying to treatment plan a comprehensive prosto case. So one question it helps us answer is, what is going to be the prognosis of a tooth which has, or teeth, which have very limited tooth structure? So we know that the answer to this question, depending on the literature, depends on, for sure, the amount of sound coronal tooth structure which is a very tricky point because all the decay and restorative material ideally should be removed for ideal assessment of tooth structure. And sometimes it's very difficult to tell where the margins of composite restorations are, or it actually is not recommended to remove all restorative materials because we're not sure if we can put them back on. And so we always have to be ready to tell the patient, well, you may leave without a tooth here. So that's not a very comfortable conversation to have. And it's a little bit of a risky diagnostic undertaking because it is quite aggressive, so to speak. So ideally a millimeter and a half to two millimeters of feral circumferentially, for sure, yes, that's what it depends on. Uh, we know that based on the literature, buccolingual feral is more important than mesiodistal feral. And uh, so if we don't have feral, what are the ways to obtain feral? So, well, yes, if I can place my margin subgingivally without bi you know, biological width invasion, that's not the, the right terminology anymore, by the way, uh, supercrestal fibers. And so um, if I can do that, very good. Otherwise, can we do orthodontic extrusion? Not always possible aesthetically and functionally. Uh, can we do cl clinical crown lengthening? Not always possible aesthetic and aesthetically and functionally. So uh, if we don't have feral, do we have predictable methods of obtaining feral? But what about those borderline cases? What about patients who have maybe 10 teeth with extensive tooth structure loss in need of comprehensive management. And they're asking us, well, should I remove these teeth and replace them or should I restore them with crowns? So in those patients, I think measuring the bite force and you know, evaluating that is very, very important. If I have a patient who generates very high forces, then I am gonna tell them, you know, specifically in the anterior maxilla, if we don't have that palatal wall associated with the anterior maxillary teeth, the teeth are not gonna have a very good prognosis, despite the fact that we're placing crowns on them and we're trying to protect them. But let's say a patient generates very little bite forces. So in these patients, 
comprehensive management may have a little bit of a better prognosis. I'm not suggesting to extract teeth in patients who have high bite forces. That's not what I'm trying to say here. What I'm trying to communicate is when we're communicating the prognosis of the proposed treatment to the patient, it may be very helpful. So let's say we tell Mr. A who has a very high bite force that I'm, I'm going to think that you're going to be keeping these crowns maybe for the next five to 10 years, I'm going to give it a 75% success rate. But for, for another patient who's generating very low bite forces, I'm probably going to assign a better prognosis to the, to the uh, um, treatment that I'm offering to the patient. Because this is a question that we always get. Is it, do you think that my crowns are going to last? So one of the main prognostic factors, so to speak, is the amount of bite forces that the patient generates. So this is one clinical question. Another one is, you know, when we have patients who present with complete dentures and they have chewing inefficiency or they have um, um, an insufficient maximum bite force generation, in these patients, literature does suggest that adding a couple of implants or retaining some teeth and using the implants or teeth for overdenture abutments, whether we're looking at um, you know, the, uh, a combination of retention and support obtained from the implants and the teeth and the tissues or whatever we're looking for, but having some sort of a solid abutment uh, to retain a removable prosthetic appliance does mm -hmm. lead to significant improvement in maximum bite force generation. So when when we're having a conversation with our patients, when we're assessing the maximum bite force in the patient, we can always tell them, you know, your bite force is very low. This may lead to, are you perhaps choosing softer foods because of this? And what are some solutions that will optimize the bite force in these particular patients? And one is to add implants or maybe to retain some of the teeth as a button. Another very common question is, what kind of a restorative material do we use? Do we always have to go for the strongest restorative material when we're looking at the posterior segments of the mouth? Probably not. Can we do, you know, softer materials, not as, you know, maybe not zirconia uh, on a molar for a patient? Of course, but how can we make that decision? Obviously, amount of tooth structure, comfort level of the clinician, what cementation or bonding protocols are you looking at? What kind of a retention or resistance form are you gonna get? What kind of tooth structure removal are you looking for? But at the end of the day, it also very, very much depends on the bite forces that the patient generates. So these, the different materials that we've got, like let's say monolithic zirconia or full metal, metal reconstructions for um, uh, full crowns or lithium silicate zirconia, uh, lithium disilicate or Emax, porcelain fused to metal composite, they have very different uh, compressive strengths. So when we're looking at different materials and the numbers associated with the forces that these materials can endure, one of the diagnostic factors that we typically miss many times is how much bite force does the patient generate. So let's say a patient presents and they have, um, you know, they don't have posterior dentition and they only have, let's say, premolar to premolar, I'm going to call it a shortened dental arch, but they and they do not, they do don't they don't have any interest in replacing the posterior missing teeth. They want to proceed with maybe three or four crowns in the anterior maxilla. And in these patients, one of the key elements is how much to, in choosing materials, how much force does the patient generate? If the patient, let's say, generates 1,200 newtons of bite force with the you know the centric stops that they've got. I would probably proceed with a stronger material because whatever we place in their mouth, they're gonna wear out or they're gonna fracture. So a very, very valid, um, I'm gonna say diagnostic factor for choosing materials for full coverage restorations, partial coverage restorations, or even direct, direct restorations. Am I gonna do just a simple direct composite here or should I proceed with a stronger, maybe porcelain inlay or an onlay for this particular patient? So those are all questions that we get answers to. So another uh, clinical question is the number and size of implants. This is mostly, um, this mostly pertains to patients who have, um, you know, complete dentures or completely edentulous or even larger segments of partially edentulous patients, larger segments of uh, partial edentulism. 
Do we always go for an all on four? Absolutely not. Can we sometimes go for an all on four? For sure. How do we make a choice, make a decision? And the answer to this question is not how much bone the patient has. It's how much force the patient generates because we can build bone in, in many areas of the mouth predictably. We have to have bone in areas where the implants need to go. The implants shouldn't go where the bone is. The bone needs to be if, if when possible, the bone needs to be, you know, where the implants need to go. So in patients who have higher bite forces, I would probably choose larger number of implants in, in completely edentulous patients, or even the size of the implants, or even the distribution of the implants, which we're going to talk about. So where do I place these implants? What size implant do I choose? So we know based on the literature that with larger diameter implants, with patients who generate higher bite forces, um, there are less technical or mechanical complications, less fracture of the prosthetic screws, given that the prosthetic screws actually are larger with the larger size of the implant, but definitely less complications with the fixture itself. Occlusal schemes that protect implants from excessive off-axial forces. Now, this is not the end of the world. If we have some off-axial forces on the implants, or, or currently the implants that we have in the market can endure some off-axial forces for sure, but Ideally, to choose the best occlusal scheme depending on the bite forces that the patient can generate. So, you know, the, the size of the implant. Again, why is this important? Because a larger size implant will accept the same load magnitude against the supporting bone. So it's got more supporting bone around it. So there is better distribution of the forces, larger osteosurface area to bear that load. And so these are based on the literature, more appropriate in patients who have high, uh, uh, high bite forces that they generate in the mouth. And the same applies when we're looking at the location or position of the implants. So when we're looking at the posterior segments of the mouth, we know that we're looking at three times higher occlusal loads in the posterior segments of the mouth. And unfortunately, when we're looking at most edentulous jaws, especially, you know, be it in the maxilla or in the mandible, most of the bone loss happens in the posterior segments. It's usually because of the bone anatomy and plus because of the fact that most patients lose their posterior feet first. So because of that, there's more bone loss in the posterior segments. Now, this has led to us many times concentrating our implant placement in the anterior segments of the mouth. And so many patients are excellent candidates for this technique. But there are patients who would need some support in the posterior parts of the mouth. Those are the patients that would present with an implant-supported restoration with the cantilever, the distal cantilever, no matter how small it is, always fracturing off, or the most distal implant having some mechanical complications, screw loosenings, screw fractures, fractures of the implant itself. And so many of these patients need some more support in the posterior segments of the mouth. Bone building vertically, bone augmentation, Posterior mandible, not, not that predictable. I know there are people who are very, very good at that, but at least in the maxilla, we're very, very good at building bone vertically in the posterior segments with sinus augmentation. So maybe this is a good candidate, this patient is a good candidate for this kind of augmentation first, and then deciding on how many implants we're placing. So I think in a nutshell, what I wanted to, uh, you know, what I wanted you to take away from this part of the presentation is that not everyone is a good candidate for an all on four. What, but some are. So you may be having a patient who's a good candidate for an all-on six. And of these six implants, ideally, maybe for this particular patient, two larger size implants should be placed more posteriorly positioned. So um, I, I guess bite force, knowing what kind of bite forces the patient generates, again, a very important diagnostic factor when it comes to us choosing the type of restoration, the materials that we choose for the restorations or the restorative reconstructions, and numbers, sizes, positions of implants, the type of crowns that we use, and for communicating the prognosis of perhaps heavily restored or structurally compromised teeth to our patients. So before getting into um, probably the most interesting part of the presentation, uh, yes, you read my mind, Frederick. Next polling question. Perfect. Thank you very much. Great. So next question is, how many patients are refusing proposed treatment each week? Great. 
Great, 10 more seconds, everyone, and we'll look at the answers. Okay. Okay, not uh, not bad. So there are only a very small group of many patients that are refusing treatments. And while there's a fairly large group of a small number of people or no people refusing treatments. And I'm not really sure where to take this. Uh, this could be a sign of the times. This could be uh, the rebound of COVID. This could be uh, the increased costs of treatments today. Uh, this really could be many, many different things. I find it's important that when we work up our patients, we give them as much information as possible. And then if we suggest something, they'll usually, usually go with it. That's at least been our experience. Okay, so what I want to do now is go through bite force measurement uh, using the InnoBite. And this is really a very simple concept, okay? The InnoBite has uh, a tool that reads the bite force, and that's what we have here uh, in our hands. And it is hooked up uh, with a cable to a uh, silicone bite measuring device. And it, the silicone device has a uh, something inside it that actually measures the force. Now you can't stick this thing in a sterilizer, so you're gonna put it in a sleeve and uh, get the patient to bite on it. When the patient bites on it, there is a little groove in the front of this silicone device that you line up between the central incisors. And this mouthpiece is good for about a thousand measurements. And uh, you do get a warning at uh, 900 measurements that uh, it might be time to get another mouthpiece. So that's pretty much how, how this particular thing works. And so the patient bites into it. And if we want maximal bite, we tell them bite as hard as you can. And that takes into account all the things that uh, Ella has been talking about. It takes into account uh, the teeth that are left. It takes into account um, the periodontal condition. It takes into account pain threshold. Because when you do put this in your mouth and you try it yourself, and of course, when I first met Frederick, the first thing I wanted to do was try this thing. I wanted to know what kind of numbers I got. And uh, I bit really hard and I bit to the point of discomfort. But I got some really high numbers. And and I'm really proud of that because, you know, nobody beats my numbers. That's just the way these things work. But it is a great tool to measure overall bite force. Okay, so you put the incisors against the central guide and you tell them to bite as hard as possible for one or two seconds. And you can actually see the numbers go up. And uh, if you want to take multiple measurements, um, just to see that you are in the right place, uh, that's a good thing to do. And once you have your number, there is a scale that uh, is provided with this particular device. It is pretty arbitrary. It, it has some science behind it, but not that much, but it illustrates to a patient where they are on the scale. Where are the highest numbers? Where are the lowest numbers and how they rank? within that scale. So it's a good visual tool. So you can interpret the results immediately and you can communicate with the patient and you use this reference chart to actually do it. Here's a close up of the reference chart. And again, it, it, if you are over a thousand, you are considered a superior bite force measurement person. Huh. I'm above a thousand. Okay, but you, you, you see a lot of people that will surprise you. We've, we've done this on some of our students and I'll tell you some of the smallest students produce the highest bite forces. So don't let it fool you. Okay, we all produce different, uh, different bite forces. So what are the advantages of this particular device? It's user-friendly, it's very, very easy to use. Um, we've taught our staff to use it. 
you know, we don't have to be the ones doing this. Our staff are highly trained. They can easily make this particular measurement for us and they bring it to us. It's time efficient. It doesn't take more than 30 seconds to do. It's easy to use. You don't need specific training. And uh, there is a return on investment here because it's a piece of information that people need to know. I'm not here to sell this to you, but I will tell you that when people see these numbers, they start to understand why it is that you want to make them a new denture, why you want to include implants, why you want to improve their posterior support, um, why their teeth need to be crowned because they produce such high bite forces that they're just gonna to continue to break their teeth. There's a lot of information here and it really works well uh, to help educate the patient. And uh, in doing the education and understanding bite force, we really optimize our, uh, our patient outcomes. It is accurate, it is practical. Again, if you do it a few times, you're gonna be in the same ballpark as long as you don't tire out the patient, because that is possible, you know? Okay. So if we look at effective treatments um, in increasing bite force, it's interesting. If you take a patient's old denture and you measure the bite force that the patient gets with the old denture, and then you talk about how a new denture with optimized vertical dimension, with new prosthetic teeth, with an optimized occlusal plane, that will actually increase the ability of the patient uh, to increase their bite force. And coming along with increased bite force is also better chewing, more comfort. Um, and some patients will even tell us that it's a, a sense of personal comfort because they don't feel that uh, they have to bite uh, easily or softly. And we know that new dentures do this, but with this particular device, you can actually illustrate it. And for this effective treatments, you wanna again, increase bite force, take a person from a complete denture, include implants in their treatment, uh, even if you have individual implants with individual attachments, that will increase the ability to bite harder. If you use bar constructions, that may do it even more. And again, when you increase bite forces, um, you have um, stability, you have support, you have retention. All this comes with implants and you throw in bite force and it's a wonderful, wonderful combination. And if you take a patient from a denture and take them to a fixed reconstruction, we all know this. You're able to take them from a very low bite force to a very high bite force uh, almost overnight when it comes to this. It's quite remarkable. And in measuring the bite forces for the patient, again, you illustrate the effectiveness of your treatment. So complete denture to full arch, what an outstanding service that we can provide our patients. Okay, so really it's the implants themselves is what allows us to um, increase these bite forces. It allows us to improve bite forces, to improve chewing efficiency and enhance patient satisfaction. So all these things come into play and the nice thing about it is you can illustrate it for the patient. And once you actually use this as an educational tool, you'll understand the benefits of this particular thing. And I think maybe with that, before we move to the next section, why don't we go to the next polling question? That's great. So next question, everyone, is do you think there is a value in knowing maximum bite force generated by a patient using this value to determine material to be used in prosthodontics? I know what I want you to answer, okay? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
So we'll give about 10 more seconds. Again, we do have some questions to answer uh, after the presentation. If you have more, please write them in the Q&A and we'll, we'll be happy to do so. Um, wonderful. All right, we got a big yes, okay. <laughs> we still have a no. We, we, have a, we, have a, we have a one person no and we have some maybes. Okay, right, we can okay. still work on some people. No, but I think that uh, it's great that, um, you know, um, most of us know that it's there's definitely tremendous value in having, um, uh, maybe the key here is if we use, if we change prosthodontics to, all areas of dentistry, then we would have probably had a hundred percent yes, because um, you know maybe we're looking at different areas of dentistry here as well, right? From different specialties, points of view of different specialists. Uh, so these are some of our clinical cases that we've had in our office. And uh, these are not the photographs pertaining to our particular case uh, for this particular one. So for the other ones, uh, most of the photographs would be ours, but these are not ours. Uh, but these are actual examples. So this is a patient who presents from, with an old denture uh, and generating only a, around 100 newtons, which is significantly, uh, the, which is a significant deficit in, in bite force generation. Um, moving her to new dentures uh, with new prosthetic teeth and an increase in vertical dimension of occlusion by about five millimeters, which is what she had lost based on our assessment, uh, got her close to 350, which is not bad. It's still not ideal. It's still not within range of normal. Uh, but uh, with this particular patient, we were dealing with extremely fragile tissues, mucosa. And so, um, you know, I think that pain threshold definitely also played a role here. Um, but, you know, I think that there are times when even a simple procedure as a realigning of prosthesis and, and increasing the patient's comfort may increase the bite force that the patient can generate. Uh, here's another example of, you know, the other way around, the patient presents with severe parafunctional habits. And this patient, without the night guard in place, can generate around 1,200 newtons, higher than 1,200 newtons, which is above excessive. So this is excessive um, force generation. With the night guard in place, he was down to a, around 540, so which is within range of normal. So this shows us that, you know, if the patient is um, um, having parafunctional habits or uh, parafunctioning during nighttime or even during daytime, when they're wearing the night guard, uh, because of that cushiony uh, effect of the night guard and also because of the separation that it provides between the dentition, it definitely protects the dentition from those higher bite forces that the patient can generate. This is another example. So the denture uh, photo is not my photo, but the rest of the photos are actually our clinical photos, uh, the, the two uh, lower photographs. So this is another patient who presents with old dentures with I'm going to call it less than ideal bite force generation. Uh, we provided him with new implant over dentures, four implants in the upper jaw with a bar and two implants in the lower jaw with locator attachments. And again, obviously new prosthetic teeth, uh, optimized vertical dimension of occlusion, and this particular patient recovery of about two millimeters. And we're now around 550, which is uh, within the range of normal. In a, in a healthy dentate patient, 750 newtons is... Um, it's very nice. It's actually very close to what I generate. So uh, this is, I mean, this is excellent for me to see that, you know, from going from around 300 to something that is within range of normal. And then obviously this will come together with the patient reporting to you that they now have a wider range of food and, and, and food uh, choices. And, you know, definitely a positive impact on oral health related quality of life. Again, this is another example. This is a patient that I've treated. Um, and these are both clinical photos uh, of the patient that we've treated here. Uh, these, uh, the first photo is a, uh, you know, this patient presenting initially with periodontally compromised teeth, a uh, very young, healthy gentleman otherwise, but the teeth were periodontally extremely compromised. So uh, if I could show you a, pan, a panoramic image or a pantomograph of the patient's dentition, you would see that uh, all the teeth are basically held by a millimeter or two of bone at the very end of the apical structures. So uh, this patient was generating around 400 newtons of, of bite force. Um, and uh, that was measured after 
tooth number 2-2, the lateral incisor on the left side was actually ex it exfoliated on its own. So with that being in place, the patient was even concerned to close the teeth together, obviously. But when he presented with that tooth, which exfoliated on its own, then we did a measurement and he was uh, generating around 400 newtons. And then we provided this patient with implant treatment, six implants in the upper jaw, five in the lower jaw, um, and uh, full arch fixed implant restorations. And he now can generate actually close to a thousand, which is on the very, very high range. So now we're looking at the methods of protecting the teeth. So we know that this patient is a high bite force generator, a night guard for sure, and stronger materials. For this particular patient, we actually went with um, zirconia restorations, both in the upper and the lower jaws. I know that there are some concerns with double arch zirconia uh, from some clinicians, but in this patient, that was the material of choice for sure. So, you know, just understanding the patient's needs and understanding what the patient presents with is very, very important. Um, I think that uh, we have something new to introduce to you uh, in the next section, but we're going to ask for uh, another polling question here, sure. and then we're going to proceed with the rest of the presentation. So the next polling question is, um, if a comprehensive course titled The Art and Science of Occlusal Adjustment was available, would you be interested to learn more? And I believe, Marianne, there's going to be one more uh, polling questions after this one. Yes, we have one at the very end. Okay, wonderful. <clears throat> So 10 more seconds, everyone. Okay, there we go. Wow. Good news. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it isn't often that you hear of a course like this, the art and science of occlusal adjustment. It's something that we take for granted, but as you can tell, there, there are a lot of, uh, there's a lot to be considered when it comes to occlusal adjustment. And, uh, Okay, that is good to know. That is good to know. Okay, so what I'm showing you here is, is an interesting device. In fact, this is a device that has just sort of come off the drawing board, if you will. We have one of these in the office because Frederick was kind enough to send this to us. And this is, in fact, an InnoBite, but it measures right side, left side, and total bite force. So if I go here to the next slide, and this is called the InnoBite bilateral, obvious reasons. So if I go to here, you will see that in fact, uh, these, these are two different patients. Uh, one patient uh, bites a total of close to 800 newtons, the other one close to 700 newtons, and the right side and the left sides are a little bit different. They're not that far off really, but they are a little bit different. Now, why is this important? Well, you know, some people like to chew on one side more than the other. Some people will get masseters that, hy that hypertrophy or become extremely active and they can bite harder on one side. Some people choose that side. And I think it's important for us to know where the forces are their heaviest. An overall number is very important, don't get me wrong. But in some patients who favor one side over another, you know what, I think this is a good thing to look at. Some people who maybe are missing some posterior teeth on one side, but have them on the other side, you can demonstrate how the bites are actually quite different between the two sides. Even when you put in a partial denture, the bites may still be different, but maybe when you add implants, the bites get more even. It's a very good way to break down the concept of the bite. And I have to give Frederick a lot of credit for this because I know we've talked about it, but to actually see it and use it is really, really cool. You know, I'm gonna push him to do some other stuff, but for now, we're really happy that this has hit market or it will hit market. We've got one. Uh, but it won't hit market until uh, 
late June or early July or something like that. And um, again, it's just more information. And you can never have too little information or, or too much information, sorry. So it's summary. There are multiple tools that we can use to measure the bite force. Bite force measurements as a diagnostic tool for treatment decisions is an important part of what we do. And so that making this kind of measurement may only take 30 seconds, and then you can justify some of the materials that you're planning to use. Demonstration of current bite force status as a tool for suggesting the need for treatment. That's in fact what this InnoBite uh, does. And you can design and modify appliances to moderate bite force and decrease complications. So again, it's just one of these additional tools that we have in our toolbox. Uh, here in the office, we're a very large prosthodontic practice. We've got a big toolbox. We've got all kinds of stuff in there. We like this thing. You know what, this thing really seems to work for us. And uh, with that being said, I will make a plug for our foundation. This is the Build Your Smile Dental Foundation. Um, this is a foundation that we started several years back where we provide dental care uh, overseas as well as uh, locally. And Ella uh, runs the domestic program where people are sent to us for us to provide smiles and they're sent from specific social um, agencies. We do have one trip a year that heads out to Uganda. We have others that uh, go to Mexico. And the idea is to provide smiles to those people who uh, really could not afford it otherwise. So I show this because proceeds from this program uh, go to the foundation. Now, what do I mean by that? None of you paid to take this program but we're going to make sure that Frederick makes a donation to the foundation. <laughs> That's what we're gonna do. In addition to that, some of our programs that we run uh, through the office um, are coming up. We, and all of our programs at PA uh, support the foundation. Uh, nobody uh, makes any money from these programs. It supports these uh, other activities that we do. And for those of you who have not been to a potpourri lecture, uh, we're going to be having one in November. So that's later on this year. It's a time where we all get together and you'll hear some 20 10 minute lectures uh, on the questions that we often get asked. So it's a very high paced, very fast, um, very, very fast presentation. It's a full day. Uh, yes, we feed you. We water you, we give you other stuff to drink, we have sponsors, and between the sponsors and the minimal costs of attending, we again generate money for the foundation. So I thought I would plug that anyways. We hope to see you uh, at Potpourri in November. And um, obviously, I think at this point, I think we have one more polling questions, Frederick, and then we can take the questions. Absolutely. Uh, a uh, great presentation. Thank you, both of you, for, for this very informative uh, webinar. Um, so the last question is, is a question for, for us. Um, so if, if you'd be interested to get a quote um, for an Inabite for your practice, please uh, let us know and we'll contact you uh, through your distributor uh, that, that you've been registering through. Um, we're going to be happy to provide that. That's our plug for this uh, for this webinar, so we can make a donation, and we'll we'll be happy to. Um, on that note, I think it's it's worth maybe mentioning as well, Dr. Barsley and Beirut, that uh, you have not been compensated for uh, this presentation um, tonight. So it's uh, out of your 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 big heart that you're helping us out get the word out. So we do appreciate that. Um, now let's uh, answer some of the questions. So actually the first one we're gonna answer is um, somebody that raises his hand or her hand. Um, so uh, Michael Bell, I will allow you to talk and maybe ask your question directly to Dr. Barsley and Beirut. Um, here we go. You should be able to unmute your microphone and uh, ask your question. 
Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, how do you account for the thickness of the inobite in affecting the, the increase in the vertical dimension and, and possibly the increase in the force being generated? That's actually a very good question. We, we used to run that question uh, by the T-scan people. When T-scan first came out, it was a lot, the sensor was a lot thicker. I think what we have to understand is we're always going to have a thickness of material and we can't avoid that. So the question is how much thickness and if we keep that thickness consistent in our measurements, I don't know if it really makes that much of a difference. Um, I went through T-scan in the early days and as they developed thinner and thinner uh, sensors, as long as you were within the range, you could understand it. What, what's nice about the InnoByte is you get an absolute number. And that absolute number, okay, there is a thickness in there. We have to give people something to bite on. Now, can we do it without something to bite on? I suppose we could. We could tape transducers to their teeth. We could do all kinds of other interesting things. But I certainly can't do that in a 30 second time slot when I'm trying to collect as much information as I possibly can. So you're right, Michael, you're right. There is, um, that is something to think about. Um, but I think in general, we have to think about the, um, the fact that we need something. So I don't know, that's my best way to answer that. Ella, do you think anything different? I think that- well, I, I, I can see the benefit in using the InnoByte by, in, by increasing the vertical dimension and seeing uh, you know what the outcome is you know are we increasing the, the muscle recruitment of the of the of the depressors the the temporalis and the masseter you know with that with that added thickness of the innobite so that could tell you right there that yeah they do need um, increase in vertical dimension and this would be um, one of the ways to measure you know what that increase would would result in mm -hmm. You know what, Michael, it might even be interesting to have several different thicknesses of InnoBite. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that might be interesting. Uh, Frederick, you're taking note, right? I am indeed. Um, <laughs> uh, before I piggyback on your answer, Dr. Barsley, I think uh, Dr. Birus, uh, you maybe you wanted to mention uh, something on, on this question? Um, I, I just uh, wanted to say exactly what Dr. Barsley said. You know, um, at least it gives, uh, it gives us some number, and at least we know that it's a very valid um baseline for the same patient and uh, as we provide treatment for the same patient where are we headed because it's obviously the same thickness right so um to to assess the outcomes of our own treatments or perhaps lack of treatment it's still a great tool to uh compare the same patient to how they were before and so, um, um, you know, um, in addition to Dr. Bar what Dr. Barzley mentioned, uh, I think I, I would just like to add that. And, and let me just add a few words uh, here, and that's the engineer talking. Um, the reason why there's a thickness, uh, we've tried to create this product to make it as thin as possible to reduce the effect of that vertical dimension increase uh, in terms of the force. But at the end of the day, we had to uh, make a device that would withstand such a big range of forces uh, precisely and accurately, and that was the result of, of the studies we've conducted. Also, at the end of the day, what's important to remember is that we compare everybody on the same standard. So as long as we do not vary the, the vertical dimension, we can have an idea because as Dr. Barsley said, we, do, we are measuring the absolute force. So we can measure the bite force, even with a lower vertical dimension and, or bone resorption with the dentures prior to the treatment, we'll get a value. Then we can increase the video with the implants and then we'll get the new value. And the standard is, is still on the same reference chart, if, if that makes sense. Thank you. So, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, so you have some more questions for yep. us. We, we do, the next one is um, when do you implement uh, the bite force measurement during your treatment planning and, and consul consultation? Uh, at the very beginning. So um, when you're doing your comprehensive assessment of the patient, uh, even sometimes the same session that we do a new patient examination, but definitely before um, 
presenting any treatment options to the patient. So uh, typically the way we do things here is we see a patient for a new patient examination. Uh, you know, we have a chat with the patient, but most of the patients that we see here require comprehensive care. So then we have a session for obtaining the diagnostic information. And so we obtain impressions, we get any x-rays that we need that the, the dentist does not that the, the, the referring dentist doesn't have available to send to us. During that same session, we many, many times do a T-scan assessment and almost always do an Inhibite assessment. So that's at the very beginning of the treatment planning stage. After that, we offer all the treatment options to the patient during a second consultation. So when we're coming up with treatment options for the patient, we already know the baseline bite force value that the patient, get, that, that the patient generates. I mean, let, let's also look at it from a marketing perspective. Here's a device that most people have never heard of, have never seen, mm -hmm. and we're introducing it at the first appointment, um, much like if you were to introduce an intraoral camera or a, a scanner. Okay, here's another device that when patients see it, uh, they understand that you're really at cutting edge of what's going on. Uh, I used to say all you had to do was pull out your Facebook and uh, give that to a patient and they would think that you were really smart because you were using a Facebook. And uh, I mean, you think it's a little ridiculous, but uh, sometimes when you show people new things, it really goes a long way to establishing credibility. And uh, this, this works, this really works. So I think Marianne, we have more questions. Yeah. We've got more questions that came in. So from, for how long do I need to keep a patient with full immediate extractions with a temporary denture before going to a full implant restoration? You wanna say that again? For how long do I need to keep a patient with full immediate extractions with a temporary denture before going, before going to a full implant restoration? Okay, well, I mean, the first thing is now once you've extracted teeth and they're wearing dentures, you need to wait for some healing if that's what you've determined is the best thing to do for a particular patient. If, you, uh, if you're gonna wait for full healing, generally we wait six months yeah. and that's when we do our next uh, radiographic examination and decide uh, to put implants in. Uh, so the, the six month time point is just to wait for healing of extraction sites. But uh, maybe you comment on immediate. So the, the, the way I'm going to answer this question is it highly depends on um, how the extractions went, what kind of an augmentation are you looking for? Um, and, you know, um, basically, who's your patient? What, what is the history of healing in this patient? Let's say a patient who undergoes sinus augmentation, typically most of the surgeons would like to wait around eight to nine months before they reevaluate the site with radiographic assessment or with the, the second CDCT. So if the way to go for your patient has not been immediate placement, which is an option, sometimes we just take the teeth out and place implants immediately, in which case you still may go with, an, with a removable denture as a temporary prosthetic appliance that the patient uses. In those cases, we typically have to wait around three to four months in the mandible if everything goes well to restore those implants. And around five to six months in the maxilla, if everything goes well, to restore those implants. But again, this is a non-grafted uh, situation that we're talking about. If we, if you decided to take the teeth out and graft the areas, depending on the area of grafting and what the surgeon's opinion is, sometimes we're looking at a nine-month healing time even before we place the implants. So then the implants go in. And again, depending on what the primary stability is, there's a different time frame that we look at. Let's say we put implants in very soft bone. Sometimes we decide to wait even six months in the even in the mandible. But let's say we have very dense, extremely uh, well corticated, um, nice uh, bone and with excellent primary stability of the implants. In those situations, we may decide that we're going to go in in three to four months. So the answer to that question would depend whether you're placing immediate implants or not, what kind of an augmentation are you looking at, and how did your surgical procedure, including the grafting and the implant placement, went uh, uh, in, in terms of you know, how the surgeon felt the outcome is going to be. Great. Thank you. 
Um, the next one is is a tricky one, I think, or maybe a, a longer explanation required. Um, the question is, how will I be able to choose what materials to use or treatment based on the bite force? So we're planning to maybe make a separate presentation just to answer that question. Um, because um, it's, uh, it's it, it can be a presentation in and of itself because different materials have different strengths. So uh, at this point, I could just answer it's it's very very uh, it's a very very big question to answer. <laughs> um, so uh, what I'm going to say is, <laughs> we promise to make another presentation just <laughs> answering that question. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I mean, you know, having the baseline bite force. Um, allows you to at least rule out particular materials, right? So let's say you're looking at, again, I'm going to repeat the same example, anterior maxilla um, in a patient with a shortened dental arch. Uh, let's say the patient has premolar to premolar occlusion, and then you're planning to provide this patient with four or three crowns or even one in the anterior maxilla. Uh, if this patient generates, let's say, 300 newtons of force, then I would say whatever material you want to go ahead with. You want to use Emax, go ahead with Emax. You want to use Celtra, Lithium, Silicate, Zirconia, go ahead. You want to go with Zirconia, that's okay too. But if the patient generates, let's say, 1300 Newtons, then I'm going to suggest stay away from anything except for Zirconia, perhaps, because I mean, full metal is not an option in the anterior zone. So it really depends on what location of the mouth and uh, what type of dentition we're looking for, uh, we're looking at, but uh, at least, I mean, knowing the bite force, you can rule out particular materials. Would you have anything to add? Well, you know, I think, I think it's important to recognize that materials have different strengths and that you don't necessarily have to put the strongest material every place in the mouth because putting the strongest material everywhere leads to other possible complications. Probably the biggest one is trying to get it off when you have to get it off. And I promise everyone in the audience that anything you put on today, you're gonna to have to take off at some point mm -hmm. and you'd like to find a way to do that fairly easily. So recognizing that uh, materials have different strengths and recognizing that patients have different strengths uh, suggests that we can be a little bit more choosy on where we want to put certain materials and in who we want to put certain materials. So this lecture that Ella is talking about will, will address those kind of issues. At this point, um, it would be hearsay for us to come up with some definitive numbers because there aren't really any studies that really look at that specifically. But we do know that there are softer materials. We know that there are harder materials. We know that there you put materials on teeth and teeth move and that changes things. You put materials on implants and they don't move and that changes things too. So there's a lot of things to consider. So why don't we just say, uh, you know, keep tuned to this station and we'll have something else for you at some point soon. That's great. I like that. Um, okay, next question. From my experience with bite force measurements, I'm not seeing the expected large increase in maximal bite force from a terminal dentition to a fixed full mouth implant supported reconstruction. Do you have similar anecdotal experience? I mean, one of the examples that we presented um, was exactly what your question is about and in 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 our experience it, it the patient did generate 400 newtons in the beginning the biterminal dentition in this particular patient we uh, i'm referring to periodontally hopeless teeth uh, but it could be you know other reasons for the dentition being terminal or hopeless uh, and we actually did see a great increase in the bite force generation on this particular patient with a double arch um, uh, implant based fixed restoration. Uh, I would say that uh, there may be different reasons for that. I mean, um, it could be that the patient doesn't feel comfortable generating the forces that we that they could generate out of fear to fracture the restorations, right? So, um, I mean, they're very, very careful, at least in the beginning, uh, when we provide them with restorations that they've invested financially in as much as they have to. And so uh, for this particular patient, I what I noticed was that I actually did have to reinsure him 
that the silicone will prevent things from fracturing. So, and again, it's it's still risky. I mean, it is still risky to ask them to bite as hard as they can, obviously. So I would argue that this gentleman that I presented, which went close to a thousand, uh, probably could have gone to 1300 or maybe even you know closer to 12 or 1300 if he wasn't concerned about fracturing the reconstruction and so um i guess it all depends on the extension of the restoration so i mean the larger they are the more forces you can generate the occlusal table how much of a you know um uh, are you going from one six to two six or are you going from one seven to two seven i guess it depends on many many factors uh and but i would say it, it probably has to do with your patient being a little concerned um uh, of fracturing things and again different patients um may differ but um uh, in, in our experience, most patients that we've done a full mouth reconstruction on fixed implant supported restoration do present with higher bite force generation than terminal dentition. Now, by terminal dentition, if you mean teeth that have significant tooth structure loss, let's say, uh, but have healthy periodontium or in a patient who generates high bite forces, that can actually be very true. It could be that they're generating a very, very high bite force to begin with, and that's actually not a good thing. So it's, perhaps it's a good thing for them not to be able to generate those kind of forces that you know led to the dentition being terminal in the first place. So not all patients with terminal dentition suffer from low bite forces. Uh, many of them are at a stage where dentition is terminal because they were high bite forces, high bite force generators to begin with. So that would be the way I would answer that question. Great. Uh, next question is, is again, a tricky one, I think. Um, does bite force correlate with uh, bruxism? <laughs> so I'm going to answer that question and say, I, I I don't think, I'm probably not. I have to look at the literature and, and, and update myself on that. I wouldn't be able to give you evidence-based answers, but typically, um, I have not seen in the para in the literature associated with parafunctional habits that um, this involuntary action that the patient does maybe during nighttime has anything to do with what kind of a bite force they can generate as a maximum bite force that we do uh, when that we obtain when we do an assessment with the inner bite. Uh, what I could say is, um, you know, a patient who generates higher bite forces will probably have more severe consequences to their parafunctional habits, for sure. But I wouldn't, um, um, I, I haven't come across any uh, suggestion of any association between the two. Okay. And I would, I would just second that as well. From what I read in the literature, there's no consensus on excessive bite force correlating to parafunctions ac activities. Um, I think, Marianne, you have another yep. question. So, Another question that we have is how does a deep bite or an arch with a hyper erupted tooth work? In, in what sense? I would presume that uh, in, in the sense of how could you measure that kind I of measure. occlusion with the bite, uh, the, the inner bite and the mouthpiece? Um, well, you, I, I would think we could still measure it. I mean, the, the mouthpiece is quite flexible and, uh, and it's, it's quite flexible and it's quite sensitive. So I would think that we could still measure it and depending on what we plan to restore or how we plan to restore it, as long as we measure the same way every single time, I think we're getting valuable information. Um, that's, that's great. I'm sorry, I'm just reading through all the questions here. Um, <laughs> Um, okay, so maybe that's one more for me. Uh, the next one. Um, is there a way to assess one tooth um, with the bite? Currently, and it's funny, we were just having that discussion prior to the webinar. Currently, no. Uh, the simple answer is no. Although with the new bilateral version, uh, it will give you more information on the distribution of the bite force uh, on, on the left side and uh, right side. And as uh, Dr. Beruz presented, we already know from the literature was the distribution posterior versus interior. So we can have a pretty good idea of, of how we can get there. That being said, if you do have a T-scan, you could simply multiply the bite force measured by Dinobite in Newton 
by the percentage per tooth that the T-scan will give you to get the force per tooth. So that's also a possibility uh, currently. And I think we're going to take one more questions. If there's more questions, you can also send them to us because time is running out. Um, and we'll, we'll make sure to get back to you guys by email. Uh, but the last one is, um, so are you assessing the TMJs prior to treatment? If you have a case of DDWR, which I'm not sure what that is, does increase in video improve the bite force? Um, so the answer to the question is 100% yes, absolutely assessing TMJ before any treatment. The reason for that is you definitely do want to have a documentation of what the patient presents with. A patient presents with a click and then you do a crown and they go home and they come back after a week and they tell you, well, after you inserted this crown, now I have this click. So when we, have a, when we have a documentation of what the patient presents with from the beginning, we have a leg to stand on. Uh, and you know, this is always communicated with the patient as well. So I'm assuming that um, you mean this displacement with, with, with reduction or without reduction by W? Uh, with reduction or without, I mean, I would say regardless, uh, the, was the question, would this affect the um, uh, measurements done by the innovite? Was that the question? Does, so if you have a case with DDWR, does increase in video improve the bite force? Increase in video improve the bite force. Um, it's a very uh, case specific question. I wouldn't be able to answer that question because it would depend. Does the patient suffer from vertical dimension loss? Has that loss of vertical dimension and inclusion result in some sort of a bite force deficiency? Has the patient, is the patient suffering from DDWR based on what you're telling me, but has an optimal vertical dimension of occlusion? Because that's also possible. In those cases, probably not. So it depends. I would say patients who suffer from loss of vertical dimension of occlusion as a result of whatever, if that loss of vertical dimension of occlusion has resulted in deficiency in the bite force, then recovering that vertical dimension of occlusion is very likely to optimize their bite force. I know that that's a very political answer, but that's the way I'm going to leave it because it's very case specific, very, very case specific. Would you agree? I, I, I would agree that there's no way to really answer that question. That's what <laughs> if, I would <laughs> If I also may add some some information, we did do some internal tests on vertical dimension and it, its effect on bite force. And what we did is we had a, a few dentulous patients, fully dentulous patients, and we 3D printed this different vertical uh, dimensions uh, for full dentures. The, what we found out with, it's not a scientific study, but we found out that the highest bite force would be at a vertical dimension that is considered normal. Now, whatever that is, um, that would be the highest value. As soon as you increase from that point, plus two, plus four, plus six, or you decrease minus two, minus four, minus six millimeters, the bite force will reduce uh, both ways. So really the highest one is as at the normal one. Uh, if, and I, I understand that's, that can be quite tricky to assess what that is specifically, especially in, on full uh, mouth rehab. Uh, 